So I'm Darby, I'll be presenting an analysis of Meta's microservice architecture, uh, which was done in collaboration with Yuri Shkro from Meta and Raja Sambasavan from Tufts University. So microservices are a buzzword. We've been hearing all about them and they've been, um, this term has been increasingly more popular over time. Just last year alone, over 10,000 papers were published about microservices, that's a lot. Um, but what are they? Um, so I can tell you for sure that my two cute dogs on the right are definitely not microservices, and that Facebook is likely not a single microservice, but a collection of microservices. But is this authentication block that I've shown on the left, is that a microservice? Uh, first, let's go over what we concretely know about them. There have been some fundamental changes to our development landscape that give rise to microservices. So there have been organizational trends, like the desire for teams to work independently, Teams want quick development of different pieces of functionality, and the globalization of companies has pushed for independent development as well. And there have been some hardware trends, like the death of Moore's law, which means we need to parallelize our computation in order to continue to see performance improvements. Uh, so if we consider the traditional monolith, which is where you deploy your entire application as a single executable, the microservices would be when you take that monolith, break it up into small components called microservices that work together to create the application. So the basic idea is that applications are just composed of tiny pieces that communicate over the network. Uh, from the current literature, we can see some, a shared understanding of what microservices are with a set of assumptions. Um, so we often assume that the concept of a service is sufficient granularity for things like deployment, scaling, and observability. We assume that services are independently deployable units, that they're small and they represent a single business capability. We assume that arch the architectures are strictly hierarchical with the front end being the root and databases often serving as leads. Um, and we assume that topologies are relatively stable for some amount of time. Obviously they change over time, but um, they can be seen as stable entities. Um, and I'll give an example of a social network application that abides by this abstraction. So we have a front end service, um, and then we have a collection of other stateless services that work together to form this application. So we have authentication, feeds, friends, and ads. And we also have a set of databases that work together in this application. So we have friends, ads, and posts. And all of these services will be connected via dependencies. A dependency is just when one service communicates with another. Um, and I wanna emphasize one of uh, these assumptions that's really important, and it's the notion that a service is a unit that we assume is sufficient and fine-grained enough to schedule, scale, route to, and observe different entities. So here I've added a scheduler and an observability framework that's built on top of our microservice architecture, and they operate all on the granularity of a service. So for example, if we wanna scale a component, we'll deploy many instances of that same ins executable. So here I've scaled out the entire feed executable. Um, and this diagram that I've shown is typically called a dependency diagram, and it shows important aspects of the microservice topology. And users are able to interact with this topology by submitting requests via the front end. So here I have a user, and they want to query the application for their feed. Um, so they'll submit a request via the front end, which will be propagated through the topology. So here I have the front end service calling into feed, uh, which calls into posts, which then returns back to the user. And all of these lines that I've shown in red, I'm calling one end-to-end -end request, even though you could think of it as many requests. But here I'll refer to this as a single request for loading the user's feed. Um, and there's lots of research in this space, all of which is kind of based on the simple abstraction or assumptions that we have on microservices. Uh, there's a body of research that creates microservice test beds. Um, so commonly they're known as Death Star Bench and Train Ticket, and then there's also Istio's Book Info. And all these test beds are small in scale and complexity. There are also a body of work creating tooling that um, is evaluated on testbeds, so we've seen some of those today. Um, and many of these focus on aspects of the topology and request workflows. So for example, we have Sage, which does resource management using topological information to decide how to allocate resources. And then there's also another piece of work called TProf, which does aggregate analysis of request workflows for um, performance uh, profiling. And all of this work um, is evaluated exclusively on the test beds because that's all that's available to us. Um, but this begs the question of how realistic is our abstraction, how realistic are these test beds that we're doing all of our research based off of? Um, and in order to investigate this, we did a deep dive of Meta's microservice architecture. We specifically looked at topology and request workflows. Um, so now I'm gonna present an overview of our findings. I'll outline the aspect of the abstraction that we looked at and what we found is true at Meta. So for topology, the first thing we looked at is the 
assumption that service is the sufficient granularity for infrastructure related tasks. Um, and we found that that's not true at Meta, that service is not one size fits all. Uh, we looked at the belief that topology is relatively static for at least some amount of time and found that that's not true. There's long term growth and significant daily churn in services. And then finally, we looked at the belief that services are relatively simple. And we found that most services are simple, but there's a really long tail of complex services. For workflows, we looked at the finding that, that request workflows are wide and shallow, which was shown in previous work. And we found that that's true at Meta, that our requests are also wide and shallow. We looked at the belief that traces are representative of their request workflows. Um, but we observed that there's a lot of observability loss at Meta, especially on deeper traces. Um, we looked at the finding that call depth predicts characteristics of request workflows, like number of calls, which was shown in previous work. Um, and found that that's not true at Meta. Call depth is not a reliable metric in Meta's traces. And even when we scope locally within traces, we found there's a lot of variation in behavior, like number of calls. And then finally, we looked at the assumption that workflow, workflows execute consistently each time they operate. Um, and we found that there's variation in concurrency or the dependencies between children, um, but that can be decreased when we consider more information um, from our request workflows. So I know this is a lot of information, and you can see a lot more details about all of this in the paper. I won't go into detail about each of these findings, um, but I will talk about a subset of them, starting with these two from topology. Um, so first, briefly, a little bit of the methodology. Uh, Meta supports many different tables about their applications, and we use two for this part of the analysis. The first being service history, which contained 22 months of data at the time of our analysis, so we used all of that data. Um, and that has information about service deployments and their lifetimes. The next table that we looked at is on service complexity, and we just used one day of data here, and that contains endpoints that are exposed exposed by deployed services, replication factors, and dependencies between services. Um, and I just want to note that our analysis granularity for this entire study is on the granularity of a service ID or service name. I'll use those two interchangeably. And that's just a unique name assigned to each service. So authentication would be an example. Uh, we looked into the number of unique service IDs over time. So here what I'm showing on the x-axis is the 22 months of historical data we analyzed. And on the y-axis, I have the number of unique service IDs deployed on each day. So you can think of that as the number of unique pieces of functionality that are being managed at Meta. And there's a ton of fluctuation here. That's, it was kind of shocking for us to see uh, this result. We wouldn't expect the, the unique services to vary this much day to day. Uh, so when we investigated why we saw this much fluctuation, we found that um, most of the service IDs were actually of the form inference platform plus some random number. Um, and we had some conversations with developers to figure out why we saw this behavior. And we learned that the inference platform, um, they append pertinent information onto each model. So each independent trained model has a random number as associated with it. And they do this to utilize the native infrastructure support. So they want independent scalability for each of their models. Um, and this wasn't, it isn't a unique challenge for the inference platform team. There are other teams at Meta that face um, multi-tenancy problems as well, like database teams, for example. And they choose to hide th those problems within the service itself. So they handle per-tenant and data placement challenges within the service without changing the service identifier. When I split this series up into um, just the ill-fitting services, so just the inference platform, which is shown in yellow, and everything else, which is shown in blue, you see that all of the variation is associated with the inference platform and all other services are relatively stable. I mean, there's some increase over time, but it's not varying significantly. So the takeaway here is that the service granularity is not sufficient for all types of management tasks, that there are things like multi-tenancy and data placement that should be considered uh, for infrastructure related tasks. Uh, moving on to daily churned and deployed services. So here again, x-axis is the 22 months of historical data we looked at. On the y-axis, it's the number of unique service IDs, but this is log scaled, so from zero to 1,000. And what I'm plotting here is creation rate. So creation is when a service ID is seen for the first time. Um, and I have it split by the ill-fitting services or the inference platform um, and the re everything else. So the top one you can see is like hovering above 100 new services deployed each day. Um, and that's inference platform services. And you can see that the regular services is hovering around 10 new services each day. Uh, when I add deprecation rates on top of that, so that's the last time a service is ever seen over the 22, time, um, 22 months, um, you can see that the inference platform, it hovers around the same, like services are created and they're deprecated at similar rates. Um, and regular services are also deprecated, but a little lower than they are created. 
Um, and when we look at statistics from the overall time range, we, we saw that 89% of new services that were deployed were also deprecated over the time range, most of that being the inference platform. Um, and only 40% of regular services survived throughout the entire time range. Um, the final thing I'll talk about for topology is long-term growth in the total number of deployed instances. So here, same x-axis. Um, but on the Y, we have the total number of instances in millions. So starting at zero instances to 12 million. Um, and we can see it almost doubles in the total number of instances that are deployed over the time range. Um, and when we split this by regular and the inference platform or ill-fitting services, um, we see that most of the instances are associated with regular services, not the inference platform. Um, and we investigated why we saw this kind of growth, and we found that this is new to, do, to new regular service IDs, not an increase in replication factors for existing services. So what that means is new pieces of functionality are being added to Meta rather than the existing pieces of functionality growing in scale. Um, I know that was a lot. Again, so much more detail in the paper, but I'm going to move on to a couple of the workflow findings. I'll specifically talk about the bottom two. Um, I'll start with the methodology briefly. So we use distributed tracing to represent our request workflows, and that's just graphs that capture work done on behalf of a request. Uh, Meta has Canopy, which is their distributed tracing framework. Um, and a Canopy trace um, is composed of blocks, which you can just think of as a function execution, where the length of the block is the duration of the function executing. So here I have it labeled as front end load feed. So it's the front end service, the load feed function. And blocks have points within them, which is just a moment in time. Um, and points can be connected via edges. So here we have the front end load feed function is making a call to the authentication verify user function. Um, and we also have return edges as well. So this might be an example of a very simplified canopy trace. Um, there's one important aspect of canopy that I need to point out, and it's that traces can be sampled at any point um, in the topology. And it doesn't have to be when the request enters the system. Um, it, a request can be sampled any point of a request execution and can be terminated at any point of a request execution. Um, this means that call depth isn't always a reliable metric in our traces. Um, and we use traces collected on a single day from important trace profiles. Um, the first one being ads manager, so this is requests that are generated from the ads manager platform. And we have 3.2 million traces collected with random sampling at 0.01%. The second profile is fetch notifications, so this is asynchronous work done on behalf of loading your notifications. And we had 87,000 traces collected with adaptive sampling, so at a target rate of one trace per second. And finally, we use traces collected from the RAS service, so that's ranking of items. Um, this service is internal within Meta's um, topology, and it's not like a root service. Um, but this is 3.3 million traces collected with adaptive sampling at a target rate of 25 traces per second. And we picked these three profiles because they're relatively important to Meta, um, and they're assumed to be well instrumented and have well-defined sampling policies. Uh, and finally, I'll briefly talk about some of the properties that we analyzed in the paper. So here I have a node, which I'm calling parent, but this could just be any node within your trace. It may or may not be the root of the trace. Um, and we analyzed a bunch of characteristics of the parent. So first, the, this parent is calling a bunch of children. It's calling child A four times and child B twice. So we can see those edges there. Um, and I just want to note that every node is named with its service ID and its endpoint name. Um, and we analyzed a bunch of characteristics for each parent or each node in your trace. The first being the set of unique children that it calls, or children set. So here, this parent is calling A and B. Um, we also measured the number of outgoing calls for each parent, so the number of calls here is six. Um, and then finally, we looked at concurrency rates. So here I have concurrency as a function of time on the bottom, and we look for the maximum number of children that are running in parallel at any given point and divide it by the total number of children. So here we have three children is, are running in parallel at a maximum time, and then divide it by six, so that's 0.5 is our maximum current concurrency rate. There's a lot more information in the paper as well. <laughs> And, okay, so the first thing we looked at is predicting the number of children. So first we identified three different categories of nodes. Um, the first being a leaf, so that's a service that makes no outgoing calls ever in our traces. Next we, we found single relays, so that's a service that makes at most one outgoing call. And finally we have variable relays, which is a service that, or a function that makes um, more than one outgoing call. And we identified that the majority of our service plus endpoints are leaves or single relays. So for ads manager, it was 54% of the service plus endpoints. Fetch notifications, it was 66%. And RAS, it was 
72%. And so we zoomed in on variable relays to try to understand the behavior of the calls to all of its children. Um, so here we're looking at specifically the number of calls that are issued by all variable relays. Um, what I'm showing here is um, the five most common service plus endpoints in the ads traces. Um, and so that's what's on the x-axis. There's one series for each of the most common service plus endpoints. And on the y-axis, I have the number of calls, and that's log scaled, so zero to 10,000. Um, and there's one data point for every invocation of the service plus endpoint. Um, and you can see that some parents or service plus endpoints have clusters of invocations that are like centered around certain values, while others have a lot of variation um, in the number of outgoing calls that they make. And this trend is consistent across all three profiles. So I have Fetch and RAS now added. Um, but I'm going to zoom in on a few of our parents to explain why we see this variation. So here I've highlighted the one all the way to the left with a one. And you can see there are three clear clusters of data points. Um, we investigated this and found that each of those clusters corresponds with a specific children set. Um, so they're kind of representing different higher level behaviors. Um, and we found that behavior is common. A lot of the time there, there are clusters. The second example I want to look at is this one I've highlighted in two, where there's a, a lot of variation in the um, number of calls that are made. And we found that that's often due to um, database accesses. So data is sharded across many different databases, and the number of outgoing calls you'll need to make is dependent on the data that you're loading. Um, the next piece that I'm going to talk about is concurrency rates. So recall that we define concurrency to be the maximum number of children running concurrently divided by the total. Um, so here is a similar plot to what I've shown before. I have the five most common service plus endpoints in the ads traces. And on the y-axis, I have the concurrency rate. So zero is when all of the children are running sequentially. And one is when all of the children are running concurrently. Um, and you can see that some of them, again, have clusters, while others have wide variation in concurrency behaviors. And this is, again, consistent across all of the profiles, but I'll zoom in specifically on one example. So here, I'm highlighting a specific service plus endpoint, um, and where we can see that there are clusters of data points. So children are either 0% concurrent or 100% concurrent. If we investigate this parent a bit more to see what kinds of things it's calling, we might find that it calls two different children sets. One, pink, and the other is green and orange. If we split the invocations by the specific children sets that they're calling, we might see that um, the service is always 100% concurrent when it calls pink, and it's always 0% concurrent when it calls green and orange. Um, and this makes sense. Unique children likely have well-defined control or data dependencies between each other. So for example, pink might be calls to caches, which have no dependencies between them. Whereas green and orange might, green might be a key server, and you might need that key as input to orange. It might be a database, for example. Um, and when we grouped all of our invocations by their children set, it, decrease the variation and concurrency rates by a significant amount. So the takeaway here is that children set can help provide visibility into code logic um, by explaining dependencies. And there's a lot more information you could include as well. So now I'll wrap up with some implications of our findings. Um, the first is that the microservice abstraction is like using Legos to study buildings. You can get the gist of the building, but you're unable to model the true nuances, um, which can have a large effect on infrastructure and tooling. So test beds need to be extended to provide support for heterogeneity of services and significant churn um, in their topologies. They also need to support highly variable request workflows. Um, tooling that uses things as topology for resource management um, should be adaptable to highly dynamic topology, even on a daily basis. And tooling that uses workflows for things like performance prediction, diagnosis, capacity planning needs to assume that there's significant diversity in workflows. Yep. In summary, we need to expand our understanding of, micro, of microservices, expand the abstraction um, to support different types of architectures. And we released some of this data on GitHub, so feel free to check that out. And that's all.